Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Hello and welcome to Countryside here on Manx Radio. I'm Simon Clark. And I'm Kiri Kermode. At the weekend, we popped along to the Villa Marina to a very successful food and drink festival. There was loads and loads of Manx produce, loads of the public there tasting it and having the samplers. Plus, there was drinks, spirits and all sorts. And we spoke to as many as we could on the weekend. Well, Saturday and Sunday, another successful uh, exhibition of Manx produce in general at the event. Uh, food and drink and wines and spirits. Uh, there was all sorts there. Salt as well. There was something for everyone. There really was. And the weather was on side as well. Glorious two sunny days. And I think it was really good for business too, Simon. Yes. And uh, the first person we caught up with uh, had a different hat on this time. That's right, Sarah Comish, formerly known of the Southern District Agricultural Show, being the secretary there for 10 years or more even. And uh, here she was at the NFU stand, and I caught up with her in her new role. I'm really enjoying it, actually. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No. I, I do miss, I, I will miss being part of the show in that way, although I'll we'll no doubt stay connected. But no, I'm really enjoying being at the union. So now it's the first event, the Food and Drink Show, and you're here with all sorts going on. Yeah, we've got uh, goats from Alaman Goats um, and from Danny and Paula Crea, we've got a lovely little belty co- calf and um, we've got a uh, tease water crossed with a Swiss Valley lamb. Well, I never, they've been new to the Isle of Man. Yeah, yeah. Very popular yeah, breed, aren't they? They yeah. look absolutely gorgeous with the curly hair and curly fleeces, should we say. They're very, very popular in the Swiss Alps. Yeah, and they've been very popular here as well. Um, they're obviously, they're all, all the animals we've got here are really tame, so um, people can get up close to them. They've had a lot of petting, a lot of hand feeding. They're getting very spoiled. And I think <laughs> that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's that interaction with the general public that's so important. Yeah, and it's been really nice for us because there's a different, different people here today than would normally come to the agricultural shows. Um, and we've been asked loads of really interesting questions about the animals, about how they're farmed, um, and you know the differences between our farming and other farming around the world and everything. So it has been re- as interesting for us as it is for the people that are visiting. And I think that's the case, isn't it? To bring the farm to the town and get that connection again. Yeah, yeah. So it's really nice, especially for the kids and a lot of the adults as well, that they can actually get up close to these animals and they can touch them. You know, that's something that they don't get much opportunity to do. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. I mean, we're just watching the kids now. They're having an absolute <laughs> lovely time. And, and the, our lamb, he's got so spoiled, he's decided that he can only be hand-fed now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's all about. But I see out the front we've got Noah Bakehouse, um, Paul Cree here talking about the, the connection between looking after stock in the countryside, the issue of keeping dogs on their leads and all of that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's something we want to do a little bit more of in the future. So um, it'd be great to talk about that when we've got that a little bit more established about um, uh, just getting a bit more of an understanding about the countryside code and how to behave when you're out walking in the countryside and on farmland. Um, We're trying to showcase all of our local produce here today. So it's everything from the goats, um, from the beef and, and the sheep industries um, through to the veg and the dairy and um, and the wheat as well so we've got a little bit of everything on display here today and I suppose that is the point here the National Farmers Union you're the voice for all of the island's farmers hopefully yes <laughs> <laughs> hopefully yeah we want to showcase just what we've already got here that's really good and 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 why it's good on the Isle of Man and why it needs year-round support from people to buy local produce we had a lot of um, a lot of demand for local produce um, during lockdown um, and we do in times of difficulty local produce gets a lot more attention but if it gets year-round support that's what makes the difference Jenny Shepherd busy as ever with the locked-ins well what a display and what a little marquee we have here at the food and drink show thank you we've had huge fun putting it all together all the posters laying out the wool the fleeces the blankets the knitting kits the only thing we couldn't bring was the meat but that's that aside what a great display for the manx local breed of sheep i i just feel that 
if we don't create a market for them, they won't survive. Yeah. So it, it's our little bit to try and help the breed. And talk a little bit, you have many of these Locktons at home. <laughs> 900. <laughs> and there's two lovely examples outside the marquee. I'd love to claim those, but they're actually not mine. Oh. They belong to Derek. They asked us to bring some, but we just couldn't do all the wool and all the products and supply meat to the grill pit, which is our Lockton, and bring sheep. So I said <laughs> no to the sheep. <laughs> so how do you, right, looking at the wool here now, we've obviously got the balls of, of knit and wool. How do you go about taking it from the sheep to this process here to, for people to buy? It's easy now we've sorted out, but because it isn't done on island, you have to send it across to be spun. And very few mills will take coloured wool because you can't put white in afterwards because it taints. I see, I see. And it is that lovely rich chocolate, chocolate colour, isn't it? brown. Yeah. So you need to pay a premium really to get coloured wool spun but it's worth it look at it <laughs> it really is now in the rest of the marquee we have laxy woolen mills here with products obviously made of manx lockton no i think they've had probably you have to ask them but manx lockton wool is now incredibly hard to get hold of so i think a lot of people are using brown shetland ah, I see. which is a related breed yeah. And it's very, I know the difference. Yeah. But it's not actually Lockton. Lockton, good Lockton wool is so hard to get hold of. And what will people use it for? You know, you've got it here in the balls of wool and you've got knitting hats. Oh, but the balls, we do everything from Aran to lace weight. Now, the lace weight, you can make delicate shawls, lacy, this and that. The variety of things you can make from lace weight is huge. And lace weight's the basis for all the weaving. So once you can achieve that, you're, you're there. So all the woven things start from lace weight, single ply wool. And that would be very difficult to get it to that lovely fine material. Very few people with Manx Lockton can produce lace weight because you have to have really good quality wool. But we've spent 10, 12 years breeding for the wool. When we choose our ram, he has to look beautiful, but the, he has to have beautiful wool. So we always part the wool and check it. And, and where will you buy stud, stud stock from? You know, the, the rams in... Well, that's a huge problem now. Years ago, I, well, I still do, I lend rams out. I've got about 25 entire rams. But of course now I'm, they're all related. But the locked and genetic stock is small anyway. It is a problem. Yeah. Um, trying to find the most distantly related but they are all related because 1895 the world's Lockton got down to four breeding females so everything's related to the four breeding Wow and what is the what is the number of Locktons now because obviously that's you know, damn near quite extinct sure. There's more in England now than here, which I find quite sad. Because <laughs> there are sheep, yeah. they're manx. And did somebody um, do a census each year to keep a record of them? DFA does. In the UK, it's only the ones that are registered with the RBST. Now, there are plenty of odd little flocks that aren't registered. I think you're probably talking in the order of seven or eight thousand eight worldwide yeah yeah no that um, is very small and now you have the Balakosnahan farm shop which yeah. is great people can look you up on the internet and come and see what you've got more and more people come up to the farm we run the most amazing opening system we're open anytime <laughs> Now that's always good news for a farmer because they're late for everything a lot of the time so that's Yay, good for us. We have a phone number on the door 
yeah. and you just phone it and one of us will appear and open up. <laughs> well, that's the thing. When you're busy farmers yourselves, it is always tricky to you stick to time yeah, schedules. You can't. And then we find that works because yeah. we don't care whether it's six at night, you know, yeah. early in the morning. So people can come. Yeah. Well, this is um, it. It's your passion. It's your hobby. It's, it's yeah. your life, isn't it? It's taken me to loads of places. I've lectured in Iceland, Norway. They love it. So all the related breeds, they want you to come and talk, which is partly where we've learnt what you can do with the wool. Yeah, this is it. Um, and we've been speaking to people around the show today that look for the Manx locked in meat. The meat, we always have some up at the farm. We've supplied the grill pit for Lockton at the show today, but we always have it up at the farm shop. Um, so if any of our listeners out there are looking for that lovely, tasty Manx Lockton, just pop along to Bollacastanhan on the Patrick Road. Yes, we, all, we always got it frozen. If anybody wants fresh, they can let us know and we'll tell them when the next batch is fresh. Um, but it's more and more we're selling well you can tell because we're putting more and more through the fat stock so yeah it is going up it's been hard work but when you love the sheep <laughs> this is it isn't it well you were saying in a previous interview i did hear that the actual wool is probably at making more value than the meat we make more money from the wool that's the reverse of the uk they make more money from the wool, oh, uh, the meat. But they've got access to the London market, the Birmingham market, and we can't compete price-wise with trans, you know, getting it there. This is it, and we have a, a serious problem with transport with the drivers in the UK yeah. at the moment with Brexit. I think uh, we need to support local. Yes. No, we're quite happy to grow the local market. We're getting it out there more and more. Um, hopefully we'll soon have sausages and burgers in other outlets because um, they are the yummiest. <laughs> they make, I defy anyone not to like a Lockton sausage or burger. That was Jane Shepherd from the Lockton Experience Marquee and before that Sarah Comish from the NFU. Yes and uh, great to, to see that in action there and uh, the, the, the amazing amount of produce that can be done from the Locktons is incredible. It really is. And like Jane and the rest of the Lockton organisation and Lockton farmers in general on the Isle of Man, keeping their old native uh, sheep going is just brilliant and great work they are doing there too. Yes, part of the Isle of Man heritage and culture for many, many years as well. Well, it was the Food and Drink Festival and uh, I went in and to that particular establishment and the first people I bumped into was the Keller Distilleries to find out uh, from Alan Gelling what produce they had on display that day. Uh, we've got our two products today. One is Manex, Manx Spirit. That's uh, what used to be the it's the cl- clear whiskey that they used to call it, but we're not allowed to call it whiskey anymore. Um, with that one, we take matured uh, malt whiskey, we redistill it. Uh, during that process, we uh, virtually redistill it, so we break it into different parts and then rebuild it to our taste. Take out some of the neutral alcohol so that it intensifies the flavour, similar to what would happen if it had been aged longer in a barrel. Uh, and that's the Manx, Manx, uh, Manx spirit. We've also got Bifrost, which originally we did call Bifrost Vodka. But uh, what we use with that, we start off with a uh, really nice VS Cognac and we redistill that similar to what we do with the Manex. And we sort of smooth the flavour out a bit, but it still does carry over a lot of the brandy and uh, the Cognac flavours. What we found is by calling it, when we were calling it a vodka, is people who actually really enjoyed the Bifrost uh, were put off because they weren't vodka drinkers. And some vodka drinkers were a little you know surprised by it so we've rebranded that now so they're both uh classed as manx spirits um and one's a redistilled whiskey and one's a redistilled vs cognac yeah well when you look at the the manx spirit and the bifrost i suppose a lot of it the, the taste will differ from some traditional ones but i suppose a lot of it will be choosing the the mixer to have with them um yeah uh, they taste nice uh straight but 
if you are having them in cocktails, obviously the the Manex works. I, I quite like it with ginger ale, you know. So anything that works with a whiskey type of drink. The uh, Bifrost I think is even more versatile for cocktails because of the fruitiness from the grapes it's originally from. So it works really well. Uh, in all sorts of cocktails. Uh, my wife Becky, who's also part of the company, has come up with some uh, cocktails involving like fruit juices and stuff they come across now. So, um, we made a, a mojito with it, which would normally be done with rum, but you know, the mint and the simple sugars, and that was great at a barbecue and stuff. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice though because obviously a lot of people remember. The, the Keller distillery there for many years but it, it's nice to be able to to come to the food and drink festival and promote the fact that it's still there producing uh, some some good Manx drinks yeah we're still doing that I've even found out that the distillery these <laughs> doesn't work well on radio does it but these uh, little trucks that were made originally you know part of the history they were something to do with the Ramsey collection and stuff and because uh, we're, it's a family-run distillery. Uh, I do the distilling. Uh, the mother-in-law puts labels on. Uh, Becky does the bottling. Uh, Andrew, who's been there for years, keeps us, you know, gets the product in, makes sure we're doing it correct and stuff like that. So. Well, it's fantastic to have a great family and local business yeah. that's still going. And uh, well, good luck with. Where can people get the drinks from? Um, you can get it on that line at mangspirit.com or uh, I think ShopRite have it and there's a few other local places selling it. Uh, I think that's it for now. We'll, we're going to try and push it a bit more. Um, as me and Becky took over uh, doing more of it, we also then had three small kids, which obviously kind of got the way. But now all three of them are at school, hopefully we could be a bit more proactive with it. Well, it won't be long before they're working in there too. <laughs> There's actually uh, one of the times we were bottling, Becky did have one of the kids, and uh, I, I don't know if this is fit for it. <laughs> one of the kids, uh, you know, one of those baby horses. So, yeah, the kids have been brought up with it, but you know, in a responsible life way. <laughs> Lovely. Great to see you to here today, and uh, good luck with it all. Thanks a lot. Alan Gelling there from the Keller Distilleries. Well, uh, we had to get a chat, of course, with the recent promotions that uh, have been a very great success from the Isle of Man Meats, and I caught up with the plant director there, uh, Phil Parsons. Yeah, it's going very well. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of people about, um, so in the sun shining, which always brings a lot of people out, and there's a lot of people looking for quality product and I think we've got a lot of quality product in this tent. Yeah, and of course uh, you've got Lee Mayers, the butchers here alongside you as well, being a good supporter of you. Yeah, Lee's always supported us. Um, it, there is an option for everybody to come and take you know, that position there, but Lee's always there with us when uh, you know, others don't want to come. So it's really good. Yeah, and one thing that always goes down well, you, you always got um, a bit of... Uh, bit of steak or bits and pieces uh, getting cooked up on the on the hot thing here live in front of people and the little piece for them to taste uh, maybe try something new yeah we're at Machek who's our chef and basically what happens is that uh, you know we have our recipe sheets and what he tries to do is cook what's on the recipe sheets and then what they can do is they can try it and then go to Lee and buy a part of that recipe there so which is always good but one thing that's uh, it's come off of late, obviously you've been uh, across the water in various places representing the Isle of Man, and it's gone down well. Yeah, we've had uh, we've not long come back from Birmingham where the Meat Management Awards were, and uh, we got Best River Beef uh, Award, and also we were in the top six of the UK for Best Beef against some of the bigger boys, as in Waitrose, um, Asda, Marks and Spencers and people like that. We've got re you know really big product development departments where we you know we do it ourselves. Well, Kiri does most of it herself. So, but when you when you go over to that sort of thing and you're up against these big names, you think to yourself, oh, it's not worth going. Are we going to get anywhere? You drove the team over there to to get them involved in this, and it, it's paid dividend by the sound of it. Yeah, it always does. Um, you know, though we're against these people. The, the quality of the product that we're sending across, you know, we, we've got the edge on the quality before we start. So, yeah, and a, a lot of history, tracing, everything's there, isn't it? That's the. I think that's what a lot of people love about the Manx meat. Yeah. yeah, we have full traceability, and what we did this last time, we just thought out the envelope a little bit, and what we did was 
we took the farmer where the beef came from, we took the sales team, we took the dispatch member of the dispatch team, Kerry for marketing, and we all went as a group because it, you know, it was a, a big team effort from farm to fork. Lots of people carrying uh, some Manx meat away with them today as well. Yeah, I think yeah. Lee's been very busy today, so and yesterday, so he's he's more than happy with what's going through. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. See you again. Plant director at Isle of Man meets Phil Parsons. And by that stage of the afternoon, Kiri, you were getting a bit of a sweet tooth. Absolutely. And there was so much to pick from, but we took a walk down onto the Villa Arcade where it was packed full of lots of crafty people and all of their wares. And we caught up with Nina from Isle of Chocolates. Uh, wow, I've got to finish my chocolates in my mouth. Chocolate orange, it was absolutely lovely. But how did this all come about? I sort of tripped over it in 2019. We did a Christmas presents um, for friends. I flavoured orange and peppermint chocolates. And they turned around to me and said, why am I not selling this? <laughs> um, and I said, oh, I'll give it a try then. So I put it out there slowly through Facebook, tentatively. And I turned it into a company just before lockdown. And our first day of trading was the first day of the lockdown a year ago, March. Oh, wow. And how did you feel that day? To be honest with you, I thought, where am I going to go with all this? I thought, we've got to make chocolate. I can't do my other job because I'm a professional musician. Um, so I made chocolate, put things out on Facebook and tentatively pushed, got my friends to share the pages. And yes, it started to take off and it has grown since then. 18 months on, we now do 40 plus flavours. Wow, and they are absolutely delicious. And who comes up with the flavours? Um, the clients tell us, we ask for feedback. I, I go through, I think, what, what can I put in chocolate? And I, I can put watermelon in chocolate. I can put chilli in chocolate, obviously. Rhubarb, blueberry. The list is endless. It really is. I, and what is your favourite? Watermelon in dark chocolate. It's amazing. <laughs> what a combination. So how do you go about making it? Is this just done at home? Yes, I've got a dedicated chocolate room. So the chocolate comes in its raw, raw form. It is, it's melted down. I add the flavouring, solidify it, and package it for the client. Simple as that, and it really is lovely. And, and how has the Food and Drink Festival been for you? It's our first time. It was very busy yesterday. We were three deep in people from quarter past ten to four o'clock. A little quieter today, but chocolate is still moving, and it's all going to go. I'm not taking it home. <laughs> that is really great, but it's a simple stand. You know, it works. The, the golden purple. Golden purple, it sells it. It's luxury and exclusive. Yeah, well, well done, and I hope it goes well for you. Thank you very much. Well, let's get a word with a couple of these youngsters here. What's your name? Bridget. And? Poppy. And, well, you seem to have made a right mess here. I hope, is, it, is it milk? No. <laughs> what is it then? Ooblack. It's what? Ooblack. Ooblack. And what's that? It's cornstarch and water. All right, so you, you make your own sort of goo. Yeah. And what, uh, what, can you make it into shapes like sort of Play-Doh stuff? What then? It's um, it's a water and solid. Right. So what 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 can you do with it? You can mess around with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've certainly messed around. Uh, have you managed? You sort of covered in it yourself here. It, have you been here just today? Uh, yeah. yeah. And what else have you eaten while you've been here and drinking? Japanese food. Have you? Is that the first time? Uh, no. Okay. Do you like Japanese food? Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Good. It's nice to see so many different ones, though. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hi, I'm from London. My name is uh, Gladys Richardson, and um, I came to work here in the hospital, uh, Nobel Hospital. I will be working in the theatre. So far, they have been marvelous to me from the hospital. All the staff, they have been very kind. Uh, I say, you know, it is a pleasure for me to come and work in the island. Because Ireland is not an easy place to work and they have no support. Because we have more, more support in London. You know, if you don't have anything, we have a other hospital, we can ring and ask help. Yeah. But here, you know, I really appreciate the way they work. It is, a, it is really lovely because um, it's, a, it's nice to work, uh, go and see other side how they work. And it is a very difficult task for them here. Well, every, everyone knows everybody over here too, don't yeah, they? Yeah, everybody knows and they're very friendly with me, especially everybody friendly, everybody nice. 
Well, so, yeah, but but today you're at the food and drink festival, and yeah. you you've made two days of it, haven't you? I I came yesterday mm -hmm. also, and I enjoyed, and I I participated in the chili, eating chili. Yeah. I ate first, but I forgot to put my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> so it was lovely, and you know people are so friendly. Yeah. Have you found any other interesting food and drink items? That yeah, I had I had a lamb burger. Yeah, it was lovely, yeah. and I had a local beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you've done yeah. all right for yourself. I'm I'm really enjoying. I'm chilling out. You know, yeah. this is a nice uh, getaway for me, and um, you know, this is the first time to. This is one of the dream for me to come to Island Isle of Man, so my dream come true. Well, nice to have you here and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, thank you so much. God bless. Well, let's uh, move to something that's ever increasingly important here in across the world, really. And Jules, um, you're here from Allergy Isle of Man. Uh, yeah, Allergy Village, yeah. Yeah, and what do you got at, on show today at the um, at the food festival? Okay, so um, for the first time, there's a, a dedicated free from stand, which has got um, products that are f top 14 allergen free, um, vegan and gluten free. So no matter what your diet you need is, we've got some snacks here for you. Yeah, and it's such a, uh, like I say, it's such an increasing thing around the world that people, uh, more and more allergies are showing their way up. And uh, it's, this makes it so aware that they, they can eat things, they can eat stuff. Yeah, I mean, like anything that's um, a niche sector, it is growing. And in the UK, they're much better at this than we are on the island at present. So that's why I, as a company, try and encourage um more snack options and we've got them in quite a lot of shops on the island as well now so it's helping people that that are just looking for that something a little bit different yeah because of course uh, natasha's law that's yes. something that's come in now yeah. um with the realization that possibly foods that weren't known about before or, or getting brought up in it yeah and um, the company that i'm a distributor for that i've got stock here today is um, a top 14 allergen friendly company so they have a dedicated factory that is completely free of those and obviously natasha's law is coming in on the first of october and that means that all pre-packaged food that um that manufacturers make on the island has to be shown to declare all of these 14 and that just gives the community just a bit more um safety and when they're out and about shopping and, and reading labels yeah. and how are we on the isle of man restaurants and and places and food outlets for for, for for following these sort of rules and, and declaring them at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's getting better, um, slowly but surely. And obviously, gluten-free is a lot easier for manufacturers to get on board with for restaurants and cafes. Um, but definitely with the allergen side of it, um, when, as I say, Natasha's Law comes in, um, it will make it safer and, and people will have to get on board, really. People that maybe just haven't given too much thought about the allergens that are in their produce. Yeah, and you've been here at the Food and Drink Festival two days. Yeah, um, day two, And yeah. what, what sort of... Uh, questions have you been getting a lot of feedback from the people here yeah I've been chatting to some really interesting people from um, old to young and um, various allergens celiac and it's it's just great the, just to watch the smile on their faces as they've seen things that they can eat has just been amazing yeah and they still come here I suppose to see what alternatives they can get see what's new every year and this is the perfect place to see it yes exactly come along and, and we've got samples and you can try some of the, the products and, and chat to me about um, your dietary needs and yeah definitely help you to, to find something tasty to eat well keep up the good work that lovely thank you well some of the people who were uh, enjoying themselves at the food and drink festival there uh, before that um, we had uh, Jules from the uh, Isle of Man allergy village and uh, also uh, some chocolate that uh, Kiri took a suitcase full away with her on the day. <laughs> You're listening to Countryside here on Manx Radio with Kiri Kermode and myself, Simon Clark. But our day wasn't over. We went, uh, well, a few childhood memories uh, for a lot of people. And my son, Timmy, as well, is part of the Cubs movement. But uh, you got in the tent to find out more. I did indeed. I caught up with the leaders from the Scouts and Girl Guides and uh, they were letting the children get uh, certainly covered in paint and messy. I caught up with them to see what they were up to on the day. So Will, a very busy tent you have here at the Food and Drink Festival representing the Scouts. Uh, yes indeed. Uh, the Scouts have been asked to come along jointly with the Guides um, to run an activity tent for the children at the Food and Drink Festival. It works really well with, with what our core business is which is you know six to 18 year olds. So across the island we've got groups of beavers, which is six to eight. 
Cubs, which is 8 to 10, and then Scouts, which is 10 to 14, and of course our oldest, which is Explorers, from 14 to 18. So we cater across the spectrum, and we're hoping in the future to be opening a new group called Squirrels, which will be going from 4 to 6. Oh, um, that's, that in, that's in progress, but it's going to be a little while yet before it takes off on the island. Now this is, is really, really great. There's so many activities for children to do. So what sets Scouts apart from maybe some of the other more sporting uh, en enterprises, maybe? I, su I suppose that Cub Scouts, we do a variety of activities. So we'll do you know, the normal weekly meeting where they might do a bit of art and craft, they might play a game of football or a game of hockey or something. But also we do rock climbing, we do kayaking, we do hill walking, we do a whole range of what we call adventure activities as well. So, so we recently ran a big all-island camp where we had the children out at the Venture Centre, we had them doing hill walking, we had them also doing art and crafts, we had all those things going on in one group, whereas your traditional sporting club, they will focus on that one sport. Yeah, brilliant. And with, with you, with the Scouts, you've got the guides, and that you are? I'm Karen Walker. Karen, I'm, now you're in charge of this side of the, of the tent. I am, yes. Uh, I'm Island Commissioner for Girl Guiding. Um, and obviously, like Will says, we offer um, girls the opportunity to get involved, um, work with the community, um, and we're just looking at rainbows being brought down to the age of four because they currently start at five. So we have rainbows that are five to seven year olds at the moment, brownies are seven to ten, guides are ten to fifteen, and then we have rangers which are 14 to 18 and then obviously you're never too old to get involved in girl guiding so you can come back as a leader or help out as a volunteer from there. And today what activities have you got put on for the children to enjoy? So we've got a really popular gloop tray with the farm animals, um, we've got hook a duck, we've got some vegetable print painting going on, we've got a bit of a quiz about trying to find what things started as in food things and um, we've also got working out whether certain foods are good for you or bad for you or maybe just as a little treat yeah absolutely now that gloop like you're saying is it just the idea of just getting really really messy is what inspires children and maybe they're not allowed to do it at home and this is they're able to do it in your freedom yeah definitely i mean Obviously, people are so busy these days and giving girls the opportunity to come along and actually get involved, mess about and actually get paint over them and whatever. We've provided um, bibs and everything to keep their clothes clean today so that they don't get all mucky. Um, but it just gives them the opportunity to, to play, really. Yeah. And I think that's what we're missing nowadays. I know as a child I used to climb trees and mess about in muddy puddles, and it didn't really matter because I was brought up on a farm. But I know that some of my friends used to enjoy coming to our place because it didn't matter. And I think that element might be missing in quite a few homes nowadays. Yeah, I think it's difficult, really, for people to fit in everything. Um, and obviously all these kind of activities give them the option to, to play and actually bring on their imagination yeah. and you know for life skills going forward that's an important thing and obviously get working together shows them their skills for life to be able to lead teams and all sorts. This is it. And Will you've obviously been involved with Scouts all of your life and, and what have you taken from it now that you're a leader? I suppose what I've taken from it is, the, is to go out there and seize every opportunity. So if I've, I've, I've ever been given an opportunity, let's give it a go and try it. So it gets you out of your comfort zone and lets you experience life in general. Yeah. And you certainly recommend it to all young people coming through. I would certainly recommend it to all young people. And of course, again, we're always looking for adult volunteers as well. It is only just two hours a week, honest. Um, <laughs> But, but it's, it's about giving something back to your community. So, so I'm a strong believer in our island, our community, and being able to just boost that by helping our young people and our next generation. That was the scouting guide leaders from a very busy marquee from the Food and Drink Festival. There was many great stands on show for all of us to enjoy, but Jeff Sansom, a visitor to the island from Natural England who was here on business with Defa, had the job of judging the best on the day. I caught up with Jeff just before he headed off. So welcome to the Alman, Jeff. Your first visit, I believe. Indeed it is, and it's um, a great time to be here looking at the wonderful food and drinks and crafts that really go to the heart of what the island's all about. 
It really is. It's very uh, a very strong point in the year, especially after the two years that we've had. It's nice to have it back on again. Yeah, and the atmosphere is superb. I mean, the place is heaving with people. There's some brilliant products, and um, it's just a, a great day. And you're here in with your judging hat on, I believe. Yeah, I've um, been uh, very honoured to be uh, asked to be to help to judge this. I've been over um, very much uh, exchanging experiences around farming, around um, the environment, uh, working with colleagues from DEFA, and um, this is the uh, culmination of a great couple of days. That was really good. Now, jumping back, you say you're over with DEFA. Now, it's all changed here on the Isle of Man with the agri-environment scheme coming into play, and you're no stranger of this. No, I work for an organisation called Natural England, um, which in, in, in England uh, runs the agri-environment schemes, and we've got about 30,000 farmers participating in schemes. Uh, similar to, to, to what DEFRA are doing here, probably um, more advanced, and um, I think part of the exchange here is really... Um, helping DEFA you know understand from our experiences both good and bad <laughs> yeah no absolutely and that's the thing farmers are quite tricky people they maybe don't like change so much and I find it quite hard in some instances change is very very difficult to achieve yeah change is uh, I mean my whole career has been about helping change in agriculture and there's been some you know tremendous changes and if you look at where we are today with some of the environmental issues that's because farmers responded to superb change challenges 50 60 years ago and now because of climate change because of biodiversity wildlife water quality they're being asked to go in a different direction and that's you know it's a big shift for many of them and the financials incentives will be moving that way as well and it, undoubtedly it's going to be challenging but um, at the heart of every good agricultural business are healthy soils clean air clean water and healthy wildlife and do you think this is achievable with the small changes that we're making now i think the way you're approaching it here is great because it's uh, it is small changes it's incremental and to a certain extent it's helping farmers rediscover you know in a gentle way in a simple way um uh, what they've always known and rewarding them for it so i think you're going about it really well quite honestly that was Jeff Sanson, the head of agriculture from Natural England, after judging the trade stands. Yeah, it's nice to see him there and happy and enjoying himself at the Alaman Food Festival and very pleased with what he's seen by the sound of it. Very much so. Yeah. And he's here with DEFA also helping with the agri-environmental scheme, which he mentioned. And uh, let's see if we can have some progression with that as well. Indeed. Well, one of the organisers of the uh, Isle of Man Food and Drink Festival is also the Director of Agriculture and Lands here on the Isle of Man, Andrew Lees. And I caught up with him near the end of Sunday to find out what he thought of the weekend. I think it's brilliant. I think the team uh, within DEFRA have done absolutely fantastically well. Um, the sun is shining on us, which is great. It's bringing people out. I think yesterday was ex- extremely busy. I think today, as we're looking now, it's getting busier as we speak. Um, but I think overall, it's been a great celebration of uh, local Manx food. Yeah, and it's always surprising um, that, that you know that you get your regular stands year in, year out, but then there's always a, a, a bit of an alternative one or a different one that pops up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like um, when the, uh, judging the, uh, the, the best stands, um, Isle of Man Sea Salt one. I mean, that's um, the brand new company, one of the best stands, and it's a fantastic product. I said so many different people have, have turned up, and it, it shows that the food sector continues to grow, continues to innovate, which is what which is what we need um, people to do. Yeah, because in the we all know how, how good the produce is in the Isle of Man, meat wise and yeah. and drink wise yeah. as well. We get uh, that's something that's I suppose ever more available and being able to be promoted more and uh, in particular at these events. I think that's the crucial thing. It's 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 showcasing what Manx food is all about. You know, we we get we, we, we regularly get inundated with people wanting to showcase here. It's um, really difficult to say who and who can and cannot. We try and accommodate everyone, but it's got a, it's got a, we've got a huge um, multitude of, of producers, um, and it shows that if you go back 13 years since we started and what it was and what it is now, it's chalk and cheese. Yeah, but you mentioned the the, the, the salts there, yeah. and that, and that's something great. You know, you think about it now, and, and you go. Yeah, why didn't somebody do it? And that's the bit. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody's is, 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 is taken a product or looked for a product and gone on, and gone and found out how to produce it. And, and I think that is absolutely brilliant. I think you know we will see more and more innovation as people go through. I mean, there's some fantastic sort of uh, new bakeries. There's some fantastic sort of vegetarian, vegan type sort of um, uh, food producers. I just uh, the, the food the food sector is it surprises me every day. It gets more and more exciting. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, I think. Uh, big congratulations to you and your team again it's been tough times but you managed to pull it off again thank you very much 
Director of Agriculture and Lands here on the Isle of Man and also one of the organisers of the Isle of Man Food and Drink Festival there, Andrew Lees. And, uh, yeah, great conversation there talking about uh, the innovativeness of people on the Isle of Man uh, just getting some new products going, wasn't it? Great. It really is great how they keep coming to the fore with all of these wonderful products and very Manx indeed. Uh, all of the produce there had to ha- had to be made with Manx produce and um, and great support from all of the small businesses. And it's just so great to have food security on this island like we do. Yes. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. The uh, interviews in full are available on Manx Radio's website, powered by Millie Chaps of Ramsey. You can go there and go to the Listen Again feature or the podcasts, and you can hear uh, Countryside in full and at your leisure. And we'll be back next Tuesday at 6 o'clock with more. So until then, from me, Simon Clark, And me, Kira Kermode. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.